Hi and welcome to this session. We are doing our question and answer session uh, as part of ASOM 2020. Let's, uh, let's start right away with the first question. And this is the first question, how to deal with lust and stay sexually pure? How to deal with lust and stay sexually pure? So this is a very important question and uh, it's a question that many, I mean, everybody is, is, is concerned. Uh, there is virtually nobody who can say that this question isn't for them as well. So even if you believe you're already strong in this particular area, I, I believe I am strong in this area, but the scripture says that he who thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. So it's always important for us to review what scripture says we should do and we should know to be able to walk in continued victory in this area of sexual purity. And if you are still struggling in this area, then this is more specifically for you. So I want you to listen and watch very keenly and open your heart to not just receive information, but transformation as well. So how do we deal with lust and stay sexually pure? I want to share three things with you. The number one is to embrace the truth about sexual purity. You need to embrace the truth about sexual purity. Any truth you do not embrace will not work for you. If you don't embrace it, first of all, it won't work for you. Now, so I had to start with this point because uh, we live in a generation where many of our basic beliefs are tampered with. You know, nowadays, many, even believers, many born again children of God, uh, have doubts as to whether purity, sexual purity is something that is uh, of utmost importance of not, or not. So it's uh, very important for me to get this out of the way. You need to embrace the truth about sexual purity. If you don't embrace what scripture really says about it, if you don't embrace what God really thinks about the issue, you will not be able to have the God results. You need to have the God mind to have the God results. So it's very important for you to embrace it first of all. If you don't even embrace the fact that you have to walk in sexual purity, you will not walk in sexual purity. So it's very important. So that's, the, that's point number one, embrace the truth about sexual purity. Because until you embrace it, it won't work for you. So let's get this out of the way. God wants body, bodily purity. He wants it. Reject any worldly philosophies that tell you otherwise. God expects purity from his children. No sex outside marriage. This is what God expects, period. And it's all over the scripture, but we're going to look at just a few things. All right, so first of all, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, uh, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you may present your bodies a holy sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. All right, so God through the mouth of the Apostle Paul says, your body must be presented. I want you to know that whenever you look at this body, think of it as an offering to God. The only kind of offerings that many people think of nowadays is, is money offerings, material offerings. But really, uh, God wants the offering of your heart and he wants the offering of your body. He says, present your body as a living sacrifice. In fact, this is... Uh, the uh, the only sacrifice that is specifically mentioned that we have to bring to God in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are other sacrifices mentioned, and we know that by the gospel and by the reality of Christ going to the cross and being raised from the dead, many of the Old Testament sacrifices have been fully realized, fully fulfilled uh, in Christ Jesus and in his work. All right. So, you know, scriptures tells us that these were, those were shadows of the real thing of the substance, which Christ is. But in the new Testament, this is one of the few places where we are specifically asked to do a sacrifice, to offer God a sacrifice. In a few other places you have, 
uh, calls to, to sacrificial giving, you know, uh, in, the, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, in the words of the Apostle Paul and in, and in the Gospels, through the words of the Lord Jesus. But the only other sacrifice, to, to the best of my knowledge, that we are asked to bring to the Lord is our bodies. All right. So God wants that holy sacrifice from you. And the Apostle Paul says something which is very powerful. He says uh, uh, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, right? Holy and acceptable unto God. So don't just present the body, you know, battered and tattered, you know, with your lifestyle. Uh, present it holy. This is the offering that God wants. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I love this. You know, some of you have heard me talk about this a few times. He says, your reasonable service. So it's not even yet your spiritual service. Walking in holiness is just reasonable. For a child of God, it's not yet spirituality. It is just being reasonable. He says, this is your reasonable service. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice, holy unto God, is your reasonable service. It is your reasonable service. All right? Do, 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 do you picture that? So whenever you don't walk in purity, in bodily purity, God thinks you're out of your mind. He says you are unreasonable. In fact, the word used there by the Apostle Paul, uh, and, and which is rendered in English by the term reasonable, is the word logikos, all right, from which we have logical. So it is according to God, through the words of the Apostle Paul here in Romans, it is illogical to not walk in purity. So when you present your body holy to, uh, before the Lord, the Bible says that you are logical. You are a logical believer. You see, we live in the world. That's why I said we have to. You have to embrace this truth. You have. You must embrace it because everything in the world wants to make you believe that no, this is not truth for you to embrace. You know, uh, nowadays when a young lady is keeping herself is is keeping her virginity, everybody thinks she's crazy, including believers at times. They're like, "Hey, man, sister." You know, why, why won't you allow your fiancé to, you know, to touch you? you know, at least he's your fiancé already. No, even if he's your fiancé already, he's not your husband already. Because, guess what? The engagement can be broken. Until that person has put a ring on it, there's nothing to do. You see, so there are all of these philosophies that are <coughs> competing for our acceptance, for our uh, um, approval. For our ascent. And I say, please do not accept them. Accept what God says. You know, those people will say it's illogical on your part. It's you're, you're insane. You know, young boy, how can you be how can you be 30 and, and you don't have a girlfriend that you you know that that you can have sex with? You know, so and because our minds have, have been formatted through all the stories we hear, through the media, through everything, through music, through uh, the movie industry, you know, our minds are being formatted to begin to think that these things are normal. We begin to embrace them, and without realizing it, even believers are rejecting the truth of God. And even as a believer, when you say you are pure sexually, you want to keep your virginity as a young man, as a young woman, everybody thinks you're crazy. Inc including some pastors. They will think you're crazy, young man. You're crazy, young girl. All right? But Scripture says this is the logical thing. They are the ones who are crazy. They are the ones who are irrational. They are the ones who are wrong. They are the ones who don't think right. God says when you present your body as a holy sacrifice, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the logical thing. This is your logical service, your reasonable service. Your sensible service. You're the one who's in, in, in your right. You're in your right mind. The other people are crazy. All right. So embrace that truth. You see, the moment you embrace truth, you are empowered to live by it. I embraced some of these truths, you know, over a decade ago, more than 15 years ago. I can even say close to 20 years ago because I, I turned 20 years old in the faith last year. So I'm, this is my 21st year in the faith. Some of you watching are, are not even 21 year old yet. But listen, one thing that helped me is that I embraced these truths and I have held fast unto these truths for all these years. All right. And, and they preserve me. I always, 
I always mention this, I do not struggle with sin, and particularly sexual sin, I don't struggle with it. I have never struggled with it in the 20 years plus that I've been a believer. It has not been a struggle, you know. So why? Because when you embrace truth, you allow your mind to be formatted, to think like God, you begin to have God results naturally. All right? So let's take... Uh, the next verse here, 1 Corinthians chapter 18, I'm still talking about embracing the truth about sexual purity. You, you must accept it. In fact, in Romans 12 verse 2, he says, be, don't be conformed to this world. Don't conform. Don't, don't, don't join the bandwagon. Don't, don't do what they do. Don't think the way they do. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So think differently. You're not going to be transformed. You're not going to live a transformed life if you, if you don't think differently from the other people. And that's one of the problems we have nowadays in the body of Christ. We have many believers who don't live transformed lives because they actually still think like the people of the world. They still think that, well, it's okay to fall once in a while. In fact, they don't even consider it falling any longer. You know, so, uh, uh, so, so you, you have to be renewed in order to be transformed and you, you, your mind needs to be recalibrated to a new system of thought, to a new belief system so that you can begin to have different results and different outcomes. So that's very important. He says, don't be conformed, but be transformed. And the way you get transformed is by thinking differently, is by having your mind renewed, by embracing what God says about these things. So embrace the call to sexual purity. It's a call you have to embrace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, we see the only... Uh, uh, this is the, it's a very interesting scripture because this is the only sin in the Bible that we are asked to, to flee. We are asked to specifically flee fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, flee fornication. You know, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible puts it this way. It says, run away. From fornication run away from it it says run away from sexual immorality in the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible run away so flee fornication and and he gives the reason he says every sin that a man commits is outside his body but he who commits fornication sins against his own body you sin against your own body you defile that holy offering that you're supposed to bring to the Lord, all right, and in the and in verse nineteen it says, uh, "Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, who is in you, and whom you have received from God, and you are not your own? You don't even belong to yourself, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, this is the conclusion of the Apostle Paul. Paul says, therefore, verse twenty, therefore." Glorify God in your body. God expects you to glorify Him in your body. Not just in your words, not just through the beautiful songs that you sing on Sunday, but to glorify Him in your body. Glorify God in what? In your body. Lord, help me to glorify you in your body. I embrace the call to glorify you in my body. I must glorify God in my body. I embrace this truth. And Lord, I receive mercy and grace from the throne of grace to walk in it in the name of jesus hallelujah this is good i love this i love this all right okay so uh next year let me skip that last verse so that we can make progress all right let's go to the point to point number two so point number one was what What's the secret, key, key number one, to dealing with lust and staying sex, sexually pure? Key number one is embrace the truth about it. Embrace it, all right? So key number two is feed on the Word of God constantly. Feed on the Word of God constantly. I'll be fast about this one because the third one, I'll have a little more to say. So feed on the Word of God constantly. All right, now uh, Psalm 119, verse 11, very popular verse. Uh David says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. He says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. It's, it's 
it's a very powerful uh, scripture. And the word translated hid there is the Hebrew word safan. And safan means to protect and lay up. So David says, I have stacked up your word in my, in my heart. I stack it up. I, I was not content just having one verse memorized. I stacked up your word. All right. And, and, and that's why I always encourage believers to, to read scripture, to spend time with scripture. We live in a generation where scripture is the last thing that we look at, you know, in a day. But spend time with scripture. That was David's secret. He says, I stacked up, I laid up your word in my heart. And the safan also means to protect. So I, I didn't I, I didn't only lay it up, I protected it. You know, I I, I cherished it, I, I held it as a as a precious treasure. He protects the word in his heart. Okay? So you make sure that once you have embraced it, you don't let anybody talk you out of it. You don't let anybody convince you otherwise. You know, it reminds me of those early days when we just got saved and people were saying, Oh, you've entered a sect, you've you've gone into a cult. And we won't let anybody talk us out of it, you know. So don't let anybody talk you out of it. Embrace it, stack it up, lay it up, and protect it. Keep it. And he says, so I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the secret to not sinning against the Lord is laying, laying up his word in our heart. Hiding it in our heart. Holding it. Holding fast to his word in our hearts. It, it, it garrisons you, it protects you, it guards you. It makes it much harder for you to make mistakes and to get into sin. All right? So, uh, and of course, I, I have this verse, which I love, James chapter 1, verse 22. So once you have, you, 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 you lay up the word of God, you protect it, and then you commit yourself to be a doer of it. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So he's saying that if you hear the word and you don't do it, you're not a doer of it. You're deceiving yourself. You, you may think you're deceiving your pastor. You may think you're, you're deceiving your leader. You may think you're deceiving God. I don't know, but scripture says you're deceiving yourself. All right. So commit, make it a commitment. Make it a commitment. Let me share this, 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 with, this with you. These are some of the things that, that really helped us in our, walk with, in our walk with God. I remember in my early days, one day I prayed a prayer and I said, Father, as I open the scripture, I want to do everything I see in the scripture. Let my life practice, demonstrate, you know, exemplify everything I do in the Everything I see in the scripture. And then at times I would, I would just, it was just, a, I mean, I, those, those were games that we would do. I would just open my Bible and I say, everything that I read in this, in this Bible this week, I would do it. I would actually do it. So if, <laughs> so if I read, he prayed for the sick, I'll, I'll look for a sick person and pray for that for a sick person. That week. If he preached, the, if somebody preached the gospel, I will go and preach the gospel. I mean, that's how we grew. You see it in the scripture and you commit to do it, knowing that you have been empowered by your new nature to do it. All right? So, commit to be a doer of the, of the word. And then, the next thing is, have confidence that you already have victory as a regenerated child of God. This is still part of feeding on the word. So, when you feed on the word, you, you stack it up, you commit to doing it, and then you gain confidence that, hey, I am equipped. I am equipped to walk in victory over this. Because sinning is not part of your nature. Sinning is not, is no longer, so you are no longer bound to any habit. I love Romans chapter 8 verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free, has made me free from the law of sin and death. It has made me free. You know, uh, I, I remember there was this brother who came to me a couple of years ago and he said, oh, uh, 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 big bro, I'm bound in this habit and all of that i won't mention what it was and it's but it had to do with sexual purity and he was like okay and and i'm bound i have prayed i have fasted i've done this uh people have laid hands on me and it, it didn't stop i wasn't able to stop it i said okay then me adding my hands to their hands won't change it so what you need to know you know upon speaking with him i discovered i discerned that he lacked confidence 
in, in, in what Christ has, had done for him and in the victory that he had had, that he had been given over that situation, over that sin. I want you to know that you have victory over sin already, but you must embrace the truth to walk in that, in, in that victory so you will be able to walk in it. All right. So, uh, uh, um, so I just told this brother, hey, brother, you're no longer bound. You have already been set free. So see yourself as someone who's already free but lacks discipline. All right, because if you say, "Oh, I am bound, uh, I am bound by fornication, I am bound to masturbation," I'm still, a, you, you know, as long as you confess that bondage, which Scripture says that you have been set free from, uh, you you are empowering that sin in your life. All right, so recognize what Scripture says: you have become the righteousness of God. You have been made free from the law. It was a law, the law of sin. There was a law that caused you to sin when you were still unregenerated, unsaved. But now as a child of God, there is another law. There is a new law that has been enacted and, and activated in your life. And that law is called the law of spirit and life in Christ Jesus. All right. And that law has superseded the previous law. It has set you free from it. It has crushed it. And so now you can say, I am free. All right, and I want you who is who are still uh, um, trapped in a sinful habit, especially in the area of your sexual life. I want you to begin to say now, Lord Jesus, I believe that I am free because you set me free. Because this sin was nailed on the cross. This fleshly nature was crucified, and now I receive my freedom because you have made me free indeed. The scripture says that whom the Son of Man has set free is free indeed. So I want you to know that you have been set free. So nothing forces you to sin, all right? There are people who just who discover that they have been set free, but they still continue to sin. So what, what happens? They're not bound. They're, they're now sinning by choice, all right? They're sinning by choice. And I'm telling you, as a child of God, your sin is your choice. You have the power to choose otherwise. Okay, because you are no longer bound. You have been set free from that law. Nothing forces you to sin. I want you to write this bold on a piece of paper. If you have, if you are still struggling with this, write it. Nothing forces me to sin. There is nothing that compels me. Sin is never something that is, is never like a rope around your neck and there's nothing you can do about it. Sin is never like a gun pointed at your you know, at your head and there's nothing you can do about it. No, you always have the power to say no because nothing forces you to sin any longer. All right? So you are free from that bondage to sin. All right. Uh, there's still a few things to say, but let me move to the last point now. Key number three to overcoming lust and walking in sexual purity. Key number three is discipline yourself all right key number one was embrace the truth key number two was feed yourself on the truth now key number three is discipline yourself all right so once you understand that you're free you know now that it's just a matter of discipline okay now job job i love this scripture of job uh job uh chapter 31 verse 1 this one is very key for solving the lust issue because lust is all about a lack of discipline so to overcome lust you simply discipline yourself and we're going to see it in in the next two scriptures all right so the first one is job 31 verse 1 it says i made a covenant with my eyes that i may not gaze upon a young woman this is this is job speaking he says i made a covenant i made a covenant with my eyes not to look at a woman, not to gaze at a young woman. Because he was married already. So he says a young woman, meaning the ver some of your versions would say uh, at, at a virgin. You know, so he was married. He says, I'm content with the one I have. And I've made a covenant with my eyes not to gaze, meaning to look intently, to keep my eyes on the young woman. All right. So, uh... Other versions say, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I think about a young woman? All right? You see? So the key here is the covenant that Job made with his eyes. What is that? It's, it's discipline. Job said, my eyes, I will not allow you. I, I will not condone you. Stand set 
on a woman. I, I, I will not allow you to do that. I will not tolerate you gazing at a woman. It's all about discipline. It's a covenant that he made with his eyes. You know, it didn't come from heaven. It wasn't. No, no, no. He made a covenant with his eyes. And, and somebody, you can't make a similar covenant. You can make a similar covenant. You know, like many years ago, I made a covenant with my mouth. That was before I got married. I made a covenant with my mouth that I was going to tell only one woman in my life. I married. I, I love you and I want to marry you. Only one. And I've done that. So as long as that woman is alive, that covenant will not be broken. That's the only one. So you can make a covenant with your mouth. You can make a covenant with your eyes. You can make a covenant with your body and say, this boundary will not be crossed. And the grace of God is available for that covenant, you know, to become a reality, to be enforced in your reality. Okay. The next verse is Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, verse 28. Jesus speaking. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever looks at a woman to lust after her. So he is not condemning. He's, he's, he's not just saying that seeing a woman is a problem. He says, if you look to lust, so there is a looking that leads to lust. So what is he talking about? He, whosoever looks at a woman to lust after her. So the problem to lust is to fix the looking. And this is what Job did. He fixed the looking. All right. You can see things accidentally. You know, we see crazy things every, you know, you walk around the streets, you see all kinds of crazy things. You see women walking naked, you know, we see everything. You see it on billboards, you see it in movies, you see it, you, 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 you see things that, that you're not supposed to see throughout the day, you know, but, and it's not a problem until you start looking, meaning until you start setting your mind on it, setting your attention to it. Okay, and, and Jesus said something. He said, if anyone looks to lust, so the habit of looking will lead to the habit of lusting. If you want to cure lust in your life, train yourself, discipline yourself to no longer look. When you stop looking, lust dies. <laughs> there is nobody who lusts after a woman in a, in, in, you know, alone in the desert. You know, just, just travel to the desert, right? And you stay there for... Um, you know, one week, you don't see any human being. I'm telling you, you will not even remember seeing a woman in your life. There's no way you will lust at what you can't look at. And you, you, you know what you will start lusting after? You start lusting after water. You will start lusting after anything green because you're looking for, for the closest oasis. Anything that looks like it. I mean, you, you'll be seeing mirages everywhere, all right? Because you desire what your eyes are set on. And, the, uh, and, 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 and James says something that, that buttresses this. He says, uh, James chapter 1, verse 14, he says, But each person, every man, is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own desire or by his own lust. All right? So until you are drawn away, to, until you, are, you actually desire it, nothing will, will draw you to that thing. And Jesus said, if a man looks to lust, he has already committed. And sometimes people don't understand it. James confirms it. He says, you know, once the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. You know, it gives birth to sin. So Jesus says, you've already committed it in your heart. And, and, and James just took it to the next step. He says, once you've committed it in your heart, I'm telling you, it will, it will manifest. <laughs> it will manifest. All right? So discipline yourself. Curing lust is about discipline, and I want you to stay disciplined. And the last verse, one of the things that you have to do now is to replace lustful thoughts. You know, you, you have to make sure that you curb the input of things that generate lust, that create lust. And you do that by replacing those thoughts, those uh, contents, those inputs by godly inputs, all right? So be intentional about keeping your mind on godly thoughts. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. I love this verse. It says, finally, brethren, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, 
any moral excellence. And if there is any praise, dwell on these things. Some other versions say, keep your mind on these things. In fact, the old King James Version says, think on these things. Think, you know, I mean, think these thoughts. Thoughts of truth, thoughts of honor, thoughts of justice, thoughts of purity. He says, think these thoughts. Let your thoughts dwell on these. So, I hope this will help you get to the next level in your walk with God as, as far as uh, sexual purity is concerned. And permit me to pray for you right now. But Father, I thank you for your grace that is available. I thank you for the perfect sacrifice of Christ that set everyone viewing or listening free from the law of sin and death. I thank you, Father, because every believer listening to me is receiving grace now to walk differently. Father, let there be a release, a release of grace, a release of mercy. Father, let every sin be forgiven in this area, in the life of those watching or listening. And Father, give them the confidence to rise up and begin to do the word. And begin to walk in what you have provided for them. Father, give them the grace to embrace the truth. To embrace the truth and not conform to the world. And walk in a way that glorifies you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.